Well, folks, September 30, 1965 was the very first airing of Trapped in the Sky for the original Thunderbirds. Now, just to go on to a little thing, when the, the new series was announced and they were slowly building towards it, I thought, okay, let's revisit the original Thunderbirds, just to, you know, remind myself of the kind of magic and the kind of storytelling with the very revolutionary um, miniature special effects that Jerry Anderson did at the time. And because I watched Thunderbirds for the first time, uh, I believe it was late September 1991, because I was part of the, the rerun generation when um, BBC noticed there was a lot of love for nostalgia, particularly when they did this uh, Thunderbirds FAB play stage where the Thunderbirds uh, craft would actually be on the head, would actually be on the heads of the actors. I, I, I don't know, didn't see it, not going to judge. But they knew there was something there, so they went and re said, you know, what about bringing Thunderbirds back? Uh, but as a rerun and introduced Thunderbirds to a completely new generation, and we loved it. And I can say, um, some, 20, some 24 years later, after having seen the reruns, and being able to take everything in and comprehend it, and being able to appreciate it, it's still amazing, even to this day. And I'm pretty sure that the generation that were introduced to it the first time in the mid 60s they look at it then and look at it now I mean yeah little things with with the marionettes walking it's not something you're able to take 100% seriously or be able to be sold on the idea but that was part of the charm it's like you know you knew there was that separation from um, reality and you know what was um, you know not real but then you look at you know, the, the camera techniques, the way that the craft looked authentically realistic and believable, down to miniature pyro special effects. Um, you know, because back then, they didn't have CGI. I mean, CGI is almost used as an afterthought these days, whereas back then, they had to be really creative in how they could film from very... <clears throat> unique angles and be able to, like I say, give this authenticity and give the scale that they were in this massive world when, you know, some of the models were probably about that big. You know? You know, just down to little things like, whether it's like little, the scales of small buildings, you know, they had to make the eye believe it. It's probably one of the reasons why Thunderbirds has la had such a long-lasting longevity. It's because of the fact it's very timeless. Because of the fact it's already set way in the future. That, you know, it's not dating itself. Because most of the techniques and um, that is suggested in a TV show was, you know, because Thunderbirds is supposed to be set in 2065. Which was set, you know, a hundred years in the future from where it was originally created. So some of the things that they were doing in the show, they probably couldn't even do by today's, uh, with today's technology. Although, we're slowly catching up. I mean, a lot of things like video conferencing, where Jeff Tracy would talk to his sons via video screens that were on the portrait. Well... You know, we can do that today. We have, you know, communications in watches now. I mean, that was something that they also did with Knight Rider, um, you know, when that first came about. So a lot of the stuff that Thunderbirds and various other shows at that time were using with, you know, like video conference technology, we've pretty much, we're pretty much there now. Um, we're not able to make Thunderbird 2 just yet, as much as that would be awesome, um, you know, we do have a space station, 
up in orbit now. It's not as, I don't know if it's as sophisticated as suggested how Thunderbird 5 is, whether you're talking the 1965 or the 2015 variation, but we do actually have an International Space Station up in orbit. We haven't quite mastered the art of being able to build Thunderbird 3 just yet, um, or to be able to have an aircraft um, with the same type of capabilities as Thunderbird 1. I, I'm not 100% sure if there is an aircraft currently that can do 15,000 miles per hour, but I could be wrong and have been so many times before. But the stories, the really likable characters, whether it's Parker, Lady Penelope, with Scott and Virgil, I'm I'm very in the middle of with those two. Virgil's that very um, you know courageous, you know never leave anyone behind type of guy that you know you just want to go have a coffee with because he's so likable. And then you get Scott, who's very cerebral, no nonsense, take no kind of prisoners, no prisoners kind of attitude. And he makes quick decisions on the spot, always keeping a calm head. And it's very difficult not to like someone like that because of the fact that he's got, you know, everything together. Because he's basically just a, a younger version of his father. And I think that's what makes the show, all these years later, still very charming and very likable. It's because there's... What's, you know, it's an ensemble collection of characters where everybody, where each character is different from the last one and to the one before them. So, and what you also got to remember is with the special effect miniature techniques. Jerry Anderson was a pioneer, because if you look at the special effects that were used in GoldenEye, same type of miniature special effects that would have been used, that was used on Thunderbirds, Stingray, Captain Scarlet and the Mysterons. And, um, because I think Derek Meddings actually worked on the first two Superman movies. I know he was involved with the first one, not 100% sure on the second one. And what I find is still very credible, particularly in regards to Thunderbirds Are Go, is you can look at that new series, even though with the much shorter runtime compared to the original, the essence and the DNA of the original show is there, but it's been modernized, but kept very faithful to the original concept for a new audience, um, there are some people that have naysayed and said, no, it needs to be with puppets, it needs to be 50 minutes. That's their opinion, they're entitled to it. But I just think that I just think that would have been regressive. Now, I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I'm just saying from my perspective, that would have been very regressive because the whole point of when you go to do a new variation or a, re or a reboot, you need to progress and actually... Take a look at what new ideas you can put into a story, but not forgetting where it came from. And I think Thunderbirds Are Go has done just that. I think what I like about the show is, like with Knight Rider, it, it's able to take you out of this annoying little box that's reality, and you're able to be free for whatever amount of time necessary. You know, you're able to just step into that world. You can slide down into Thunderbird 2 and take off from Tracy Island and, you know, um, deliver the mole to New York City or to take, you know, the Firefly bulldozer to Los Angeles and put fires out. You're able to go with Alan Tracy on a mission to the moon to dig out, a, you know, to save, save the passengers of a crash shuttle or you're able to get to Thunderbird 1. You're able to go on board with Thunderbird 1 and lift people that are, you know, that are on a runaway train that are going to plunge into, you know, a, a wild river, you know. It's 
you know, it's been, like I say, it's been able to take you out of reality, because, in my honest opinion, reality's boring. Reality's something you can go step out into the street, you know? I come home from work, I want to, if I switch TV on, I want, I want fantasy, I want adventure. I don't fight, you know, and then you see reality TV and you think, why is this on? You know, you can go out on the street and watch that. Put up yourself a makeshift TV screen with a hole in it and watch, you know, watch people. That'd be damn creepy, but it's like, no, this is the real reality TV. But anyway, tangent, getting over it. I think, and also, like I say, for Thunderbirds, it's timeless. You know, it's something you can keep bringing back generation after generation after generation, and so many children of so many ages love it, as well as us older children that saw it at our respective times when it was rerun. Because I think the first time Thunderbirds was rerun was the early 90s, then it was rerun again in 2000, had a minor run on Cartoon Network in 2004 with the movie. <laughs> And the fact that, you know, you can show it to any, the original series to anyone on DVD and now Blu-ray. Thunderbirds, Thunderbirds on Blu-ray looks awesome, by the way. Go get it. Um, it's just something, you know, it's very hard to put into perspective because it's such a larger-than-life series. And that's what I think works best, you know, for it. It's... There's, you know, there's a great shelf life for that, for it. When something else doesn't work, us on TV, you put Thunderbirds on, ratings. It's that simple. I think the other thing is, it's a real shame that the great Jerry Anderson is no longer with us because he was the absolute masterminded genius that created all of this and so many years later we're still enjoying all you know the wondrous work wonderful works that he created and he's one of those people I think that's never going to be replaced you know Walt Disney is you know a genius and a legend that only comes around once in a lifetime, Jerry Anderson is exactly the same. And a lot of people have compared him to Walt Disney with what he did with Thunderbirds and Stingray, which is my personal favorite. It's because of the fact, because of the animation that he would use with the marionettes, which, by the way, he hated marionettes, but he liked Parker, which is kind of interesting. A lot of people compared him to being the to Britain's answer to Walt Disney, and I think that statement is very true, because you look at a lot of other of you know puppet and marionette shows. You you didn't take them seriously, yet he wanted to when he made what he dubbed as super marionation shows. He wanted to make them look as credible and as lifelike as possible, and I say to that, he did just that. Mission accomplished. Now the question uh, that I'd like to see answered in another 50 years time, will we see yet another generation of Thunderbirds where we go back and actually be looking a hundred years into the past with the adventures of the original generation of the Tracy family? In 50 years time, will they still look at that and think, that's not bad. You know, it's like it's a century be behind everything else, but that's not bad. And I'm hoping very much that in many years to come, when it's MJ Knight Jr., maybe, who can say, that, you know, he or she will look at Thunderbirds and Thunderbirds are go and be like, Dad, these shows are cool. Why are they not making them like like this? And I'd say to them, I was asking this, and I would say to them, I was asking the same question when I was your age. <laughs> but yeah, 
Happy 50th anniversary, Thunderbirds. Keep the mission alive.